Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Partners Health Management Community Cafe for October. I'm just giving everyone a moment to make sure everybody can get in before we get started. <clears throat> Are you 200 a month? Maybe. Okay, I need to. So I think that's pretty close to everyone. So uh, again, uh, uh, welcome to Partners Community Cafe. My name is Jeannie Patterson, and I am one of the community training coordinators at Partners. And uh, the topic this month, as you as you probably know, is about domestic violence, because this is October's Domestic Violence Awareness Month. I have my little pin on, I don't know if you can see it, but commemorating the month. <clears throat> and so I um, just want to share very, very briefly just a little bit of information. And then if you'd like this, if you'd like to have this document, Amani is going to put it in the chat for you. Uh, so uh, uh, just a quick two minutes about what to, about domestic violence. So the definition that I use for domestic violence is that is the willful intimidation, physical assault, battery, sexual assault, and or other abusive behavior as part of a systematic pattern of power and control by one intimate partner on the other. And of course the the important things, if you probably noticed in my emphasis, is that it's something that's willful and it's part of a pattern of power and control. It is not the same thing as anger management. Uh, people have difficulty with anger management. So a little, just a little bit about it is that it can result in lots of kinds of problems, physical in injury, definitely psychological uh, 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 trauma, death in many cases. It impacts uh, the, the, the people who, who have who are being battered, it also impacts children in the household as well. Uh, the, some of the statistics is that one in three women and one in four men in the United States have experienced some kind of physical violence by an intimate partner. And in North Carolina, uh, more than 35% of women and 30% of men have experienced domestic violence and stalking at one time. Uh, and so I'm not gonna go through the rest of these because I want to let our speakers uh, uh, ask them to, uh, to talk. So our first speaker for today is Molly Weekland, who is with Hope United Network in Gastonia. And I'm going to stop sharing, Molly. So thank you, Molly, for being here. And the floor is now yours. Thank you. I'm just going to get this pulled up real quick. OK. So um, like Jeannie said, my name is Molly Weekland, um, and I am uh, the Special Events and Marketing Coordinator for Hope United Survivor Network here in Gaston County. And kind of to, uh, have to do it with my hands, but Hope United is a department that houses all of survivor services in Gaston County. So we have the Lighthouse Children's Advocacy Center, we have the Domestic Violence Shelter, and then we have our community-based Family Justice Center and our court-based Family Justice Center. So today I have a presentation, just kind of a quick overview of what is domestic violence, but um, I kind of wanted to focus a little bit on what we are doing here in Gaston County um, and, and the impacts that we are seeing. So um, go ahead and get started. So how did we get here? Gaston County used to have uh, all of these programs. Um, and in 2020, we kind of looked at it as a whole. And if we're talking about prevent prevention and getting upstream of um, intimate partner violence, then it really needs to start when we are encountering these folks um, at the lighthouse um, and on through um, when we have folks that come to our family or come to our um, domestic violence shelter and Hope United. And these are all different programs, but we do overlap and serve a lot of the same types um, of, of people. 
and types of victimization. So the lighthouse um, is where we do our forensic interviews for children who have witnessed violent crime. Oftentimes that could be, you know, within their home and it could be domestic violence um, or have experienced severe um, sexual abuse, physical abuse, neglect, human trafficking, those types of things. Um, we have our domestic violence shelter, which is um, a safe residence for men, women, and children who are fleeing domestic violence in Gaston County, but we serve all around. And sometimes we know that it is a lot safer for someone to come to Gaston County, or maybe they have family here. Um, so we do serve um, families outside of Gaston County. And then for Hope United Survivor Network, the family or the Family Justice Center that's community-based. We serve men, women, um, and children often who have experienced domestic violence, sexual assault, uh, human trafficking, elder abuse, and then adult survivors of childhood trauma. So we are wraparound services for, for those folks. And then we have our court-based services where we have um, a survivor suite in the court in the courthouse in Gaston County where survivors can meet with a clinician. Um, they can print off pictures for evidence. They can meet with an advocate. We can accompany them to court We can get them a cup of coffee. We watch children. Um, the last place we want kids to be after, you know, an incident is to be in the courtroom re, you know, hearing that story again. Um, so we try, the goal is to identify barriers and remove barriers. And we are um, constantly working with community partners. We do not do it alone, who can help us um, remove those barriers for survivors. So we got here by, um, we had an intern in 2018 out of the shelter and we said, okay, um, here is a trauma history, here's a story, this is what happened. Now go put all the services in place that we ask survivors to put in place every single day. Um, here's some bus tickets and you need to be back here at the shelter at three because the bus is gonna drop your kids off. So, you know, chop chop kind of thing. And so it took her an insane amount of time. She encountered so many barriers. She waited on buses that never came. She sat in offices where people were not as helpful. Um, she didn't know the systems. So she was kind of going at it blindly, which is oftentimes um, what we're asking survivors to do. And we kind of, you know, we took that information and we said we can do better. And so we opened the Family Justice Center where survivors can come to us. And then we pull the, the partners in that they ask us to. So we are always survivor driven. Um, sometimes we're helping people who are saying, I'm never going to leave this situation. But what I would really like to do is uh, talk to someone about it, or I would like more information, more information about a support group. Um, so we're there to assist them with what they identify their needs to be. Um, one of the really cool things that Gaston County has done um, in the last little let's see, last six months is we have implemented the danger assessment for law enforcement. And it is a tool that can be used on scene when officers are responding to, um, to calls where there is intimate partner violence. And it's just 11 questions and it will help, help with the DA's office when they're asking for bail and bond conditions. So that tool is then sent to the district attorney's office and sent to us because what we know is that the quicker we can wrap services around these um, survivors, the better the outcomes are going to be. So we have implemented that. It has been very successful thus far. Our district attorney has repeatedly said, you know, if these offenders, if we can identify the highest risk offenders and it is predictable, then it is preventable. And so that is the approach that we have kind of taken in this community. And um, so far it has been incredibly successful and um, we're really proud of that work. So um, so what is domestic violence? I know Jeannie touched a little bit on it and what, when we're talking to survivors, oftentimes we're talking about um, patterns of behavior. So um, what what is someone doing that's a pattern of behavior that is um, the goal is to gain or maintain power and control over somebody. So um, we use the power and control wheel, and I think it's later in this presentation, to kind of look for those types of things on the power and control wheel. And if you're not familiar with the power and control wheel, it's an, it's an excellent tool to use, and we'll get to that. But we um, we talk uh, with survivors who, um, you know, 
or like, I don't need your services because it's not physical. Um, and every single day we are, you know, pushing the education out there that it does not have to be physical for it to be dangerous. And it also doesn't have to be ever be physical for it to end in a homicide. And we have seen that um, unfortunately, again and again and again, where some of the you know someone will say, well, he was, he or she was never um, never laid their hands on me, and I never knew they had a gun. And then it's that pattern of of um, power and control that once that's challenged by someone like a provider um, or law enforcement, then that's when someone will um, oftentimes. Um, you know, up the ante, so to speak, and then it does become physical or it does become homicidal or suicidal. Um, and we know that it is for survivors, the most dangerous time for them is in the two weeks after they leave a domestic violence situation. So for us, our goal during that time period is to wrap services around. Um, we know that they're 70 times more likely to die of a homicide in the two weeks after they leave than they were in the relationship. So if we know that making sure that we have safety planning measures in place when survivors are coming to us and saying, I was strangled or, um, or he has a gun or, you know, she has a gun, anything like that, we're trying to get upstream of that. Um, so this is the power and control wheel that I talked about. The What I often like to point out when, when we're providing education is, um, you know, we know marks and bruises. That's something that when you kind of synonymous with um, when you say domestic violence, but oftentimes it's that using intimidation. So it is maybe not uh, physically touching anyone, but it's going and getting a weapon and just laying it on the coffee table during a fight. Um, things like that. Uh, using isolation, it's a lot easier to perpetrate violence against someone who doesn't have anyone there to stand up and say, hey, Molly, what are you doing? Like, that's, that's not okay. That's not acceptable behavior. Let's go get help. Um, so oftentimes what we see is the first kind of red flag is that isolation factor, um, you know, saying things to uh, their partner like, oh, your mom calls so much. Why is your mom always calling? I just want this time, just you and me. Um, or your friend makes you look bad. Why do you hang out with that person? That kind of stuff. Um, and then oftentimes we see the minimize, deny, and blame. So we'll have survivors that will say to us, you know, your services aren't for me. It's, it's you know. Yes, he yells at me and he takes my money and he uses the kids against me, but he has never left a mark. And it's like, well, that's not, that doesn't mean what is going on is okay. Um, and so we'll have, we hear abusers will say, um, you know, I've never, I've never, uh, you know, broken a bone. Look at Sally and her husband. Every time he gets drunk, he will push her down and she's got marks and bruises all over her. And I've never done that, but I will push you or, you know, things like that. And neither one are right. Um, this is a quote from someone that I think is a fantastic advocate for domestic violence, uh, Mark Wynn. And we, this is kind of was in the back of our mind when we were talking about implementing the Dale. Domestic violence is not an incident, it's a course of conduct. And so we need to respond in that way. Um, it makes the community safer if we know who the highest risk offender, highest risk offenders are, because those are the people who are most likely to uh, perpetrate violence against law enforcement, um, to use weapons in kind of an indiscriminate way. Um, and so responding to it in that way is, is kind of what framed our work around the Dale. Um, and then the cycle of abuse. So we often, you know, we don't see a lot of survivors when they're in that reconciliation phase. We see them um, when that tension is building or right after an incident has occurred. But this kind of ties into that course of conduct thought process that, you know, often, you know, EMS is responding to the scene of an incident. Law enforcement is responding to the scene of an incident. But these are patterns of behavior that are, are stemming from potentially years and years um, in this relationship. So responding to an isolated incident, keeping in mind that this is, the dynamics are much deeper and, and rooted in something more than just what you're seeing. Um, and then the, we'll skip this for time time's sake, but um, if you don't know the story of Jamie Kimball, it's a fantastic story uh, or a fantastic cautionary tale um, of a tragic incident that happened um, not far from here where Jamie um, kind of same 
kind of what I was saying where it was never, um, it was never physical violence. It was always that power and control that you could see kind of coming out in, um, it was verbal or it was emotional and things like that. And um, ultimately her, um, her boyfriend took her life and it was, you know, months after they had broken up, um, her family was just unaware that he had that potential um, to, or potential to be that violent. And so um, her family started the Jamie Kimball Foundation for Courage out of Charlotte, and they're doing fantastic work um, in the prevention kind of sphere as well. Um, and Jeannie went over a lot of these stats. These are um, the one I always like to kind of hit on is that um, women between the ages 16 to 18 to 24 are at the highest risk of intimate partner violence. Um, so getting ahead of that and doing the work, in the, whether it's in the school system or in clubs, to, um, to kind of set up those healthy relationship ideas, giving, you know, kids the tools that it as they start embarking on their dating lives, um, that they know who they can call and what a healthy relationship looks like and what an unhealthy relationship looks like. Um, here in Gaston County, we had a, this year we're on track to be a little bit higher, um, but it's usually around it's like a thousand calls per year to the shelter. Um, and those are people who are currently fleeing domestic violence and looking for shelter. And then on the back end, the Family Justice Center serves people who um, may never need shelter. That might not be anything that they would ever kind of identify as um, part of their safety planning. Maybe they have resources to go somewhere else or they have family that they can stay with where they feel safe. Um, so that number, I feel like it is incredibly high. Um, and I know looking at stats from last year, just that number. And then you look at how many calls for service there were in Gaston County, people that involved domestic violence was over 6,000. So um, we know that this is prevalent. And um, so we're trying to get as, as many resources out there as possible. Um, and then I know that um, we kind of started off with an overview of Hope United and I'll be here at the end to answer any questions that you guys might have, but just for the sake of time, thank you so much for, um, for having me and I will um, I'll stick around. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Molly. I wish we had more time because I really was, was interested in what all you were talking about. I wanna make sure we can give time to our other speakers as well. So our next speakers are Molly, or, um, Michelle Knapp, sorry, I'm gonna, my name's all mixed up. Michelle Knapp and Emily Cowan, who are with Fifth Street Ministry in Iredale County. They're gonna talk about their program. So thank you much ladies, so much ladies for being here and the floor is now yours. Okay, thank you. I am going to just share a couple um, slides for you all. So um, My Sister's House, which is a program of Fifth Street Ministries. Fifth Street Ministries is located in Iredale County. Um, we provide services to individuals in our region, which is Iredell, Surrey, Stokes, Yadkin, and Davie counties. Uh, My Sister's House is one of our largest programs that provides services to victims of domestic violence and sexual assault um, and human trafficking. We are the only um, domestic violence shelter in our five county region. And so we, we serve a lot of individuals um, every year. Um, each year, we do serve um, approximately 200 women uh, or um, men, women, and children in our shelter. We do also provide shelter to men that are victims of domestic violence. Um, and so uh, about 200 are served throughout our, through our shelter, in addition to another uh, couple 200 that are served by our um, court advocate. And Emily, who is our advocate, will give you a little bit more information on that, as well as our uh, DV task force um, that is associated with that symposium that you can see the picture of. So, um, and we also provide counseling to victims as well. And our counselors provide um, about 200 individuals. I know it kind of seems <laughs> 200, 200, 200, but we have, we serve about 600 individuals per year. Now, um, they do not have to be residents of our shelter to, to um, get services. Um, anyone that is a victim can receive services from us, whether it be counseling, advocacy um, or, or just resources. Um, 
and group therapy as well. So um, I wanna give you a little bit of statistics here that the state has put out. Um, uh, that's not quite the one. I am sorry, I had a better version of it. Um, so you could see it better, but I guess that's that's the best you could do. So every year, um, the state comes to the state asks domestic violence providers to do a point in time count, similar to a homeless point in time count. This is um, counting victims um, that are being served on a one day, one day out of the year. And as you can see, 65 of the providers that um, that provide services throughout North Carolina. Uh, responded to this survey, so not a, not 100% participation, but just from those 65 providers, they served 1,403 victims in that one day. So that is a lot of people coming through our system that are needing resources for domestic violence services. Um, additionally, 546 hotline calls were, were received in that one day. So imagine multiplying that times 365 days. We, we have a lot of activity here at our shelter. Um, our advocates are constantly working day in and day out to assist victims of domestic violence and sexual assault. Um, we have two advocates on staff and we also have two counselors on staff with additional uh, interns. We, we do have an internship program and we work closely with local colleges to, to have interns here to provide services, additional services to those in need. Um, so um, again, we, we do a lot of work here in our program and I'm gonna let Emily talk a little bit more um, about our, our um, um, DV task force. So that's, that's how you all have us listed on this um, agenda is based on our domestic violence task force. So Ardell County has a domestic violence task force that was created several years ago. Um, Emily was one of the creators of that, as well as my predecessor um, of our agency. And so it, it has been working wonderfully over the years. We do the DV symposium every year. and We'd love to invite you all to join us. Our next one will be in April, but I will let Emily talk a little bit more about that um, and give you a little bit more information on that. Emily? Okay, good morning. Um, so we are a part of the Iredell County Domestic Violence Task Force. We meet every, the third Wednesday of every month. Um, typically we meet in Statesville. We have also met in Mooresville at different locations. Just last week, our task force met at the college in Mooresville. We were able to do the um, domestic violence simulation um, where we had our normal agencies, but also had a lot of community um, interest in that to where they were kind of able to walk through the shoes of a victim um, to see the, the struggles that they face, the barriers, um, a lot of reasons why they, they may choose to stay in the domestic violence situation. Um, but as far as our task force, we meet monthly. It varies. We may have, we may bring different speakers in um, from state level, um, from the coalitions to update us on new changes, to provide awareness information, community information, education. We also rely heavily on community resources to come in and we discuss current issues that our, our community specifically may be seeing as far as domestic violence. Um, we have various agencies that are active. We have law enforcement um, who are very active each month. Our DA's office is very active um, along with individuals from the court system, different service providers. So we're able to come together to brainstorm, to discuss different, different issues, different barriers that victims may face within our county, um, as well as the options that are available for them. Um, we work, as Michelle said, we do the domestic violence symposium last or actually this year in April was our first one post COVID. So we 
we're hoping to grow and to expand each year. We look at, you know, we get grant funding to provide um, different types of trainings through that, different speakers. So we're looking to grow that each year. Um, and as dates are set in stone, we will certainly send that information out to other other counties, other agencies, because we want to reach as many people as possible as far as the the training that we can offer. And it's always free. Um, and it's la this year it was in Mooresville. Um, it will be held in Ardell County. We've done it in Statesville before. It just depends. Um, but that's a lot of what we do. We work closely together, um, you know, to address the issues and to our, our main goal is to provide services at the, you know, the best we can for victims um, and to also overcome the barriers within our county. Thank you so much, Emily. Does that finish your presentation for yes, you, ma'am? Michelle, thank you so much. So our last speaker for today is Danielle Sigmund, who is with Partners, and she works with the Healthy Opportunities Pilot, and she'll talk about social determinants of health. The floor is yours, Danielle. Good morning. I'm Danielle Sigmund. I am a Healthy Opportunity Specialist here at Partners, and I'm going to be sharing a PowerPoint on our social determinants of health. Social determinants of health are the way people are born, live, work, grow, and age. We all experience differences in our life experiences, our opportunities, and stress. So why do we look at social determinants of health for the members that we work with? We do this in order to provide whole person care, identify needs, recognize needs, and establish goals related to their social determinants of health. So we look at, you know, does a person need food? Do they, do they need help with transportation? Are they experiencing any safety concerns in their environment? And that's where interpersonal safety and domestic violence really come into play because we're able to have those conversations with our community members about, you know, do you feel safe in your home? And if the answer is no, then we can explore why that person doesn't feel safe. And is that due to any domestic violence that they may be experiencing? And how? Implement social determinants of health assessment tools, collect patient level information related to social determinants of health, and we can create workflows to track and address a patient's needs and identify social service resources and track linkages. So our providers here in the counties that we work with are asked to complete a social determinants of health assessment on each member that they work with. So they are the frontline staff. They are the ones talking with the person about any safety concerns and any needs that that person has. And then we get the data. So that explains the how, because we are able to see the big picture and see what's needed within our community and you know what people are facing. Why is it important to measure social determinants of health? Conditions such as food insecurity, housing instability, unmet transportation needs, and interpersonal violence not only have a deep impact on a person's health, safety, and well-being, but also on a health care utilization and cost. Strategic interventions and investments in these initial core domains of food, housing, transportation, 
and interpersonal safety in partnership with local community groups and healthcare providers will help us meet our mission of improving health, safety, and well being for all members that we're working with here in North Carolina. It also provides short and long term cost savings and makes our healthcare system more efficient. Partners have sufficient data to suggest that the focus on social determinants of health is critical to consider if a whole person perspective is to be targeted and accomplished. Behavioral health has to consider the influence of social determinants of health deficits when considering treatment planning and interventions, both as a focus of intervention and as possible influences to the member's ability to engage and benefit from services. It's very important to know like, if someone has access to food and if someone feels safe in their environment because if their basic needs are not being met, then it's very difficult to move forward with effective long-term treatment. So we really focus on treating someone as a whole person. Clinicians and physicians will know that asking if something has been an issue in the last year is not the same as asking specifically if issues are a current concern. For example, if a member is existing with insufficient food for this month, currently that will have a larger effect on wellness and the potential to engage in treatment than if this problem existed 11 months ago. So, by saying this, it's important that when looking at social determinants of health, we not only look at, you know, has this been an issue in the past six months? Is this an issue right now? You know, what are you dealing with right now that is keeping you from reaching your goals? If you have any questions relating to social determinants of health, please reach out. Um, you will see two email addresses on your screen. We have our social determinants of health group. SDOH at partnersbhm.org, or you can email me directly, dsigmund at partnersbhm.org, and I would be more than happy to talk with you more about social determinants of health. And even if you wanted to explore how this, how social determinants of health integrates with domestic violence and interpersonal violence, I would be more than happy to talk with you about that as well. Thank you so much. Thank you, Danielle. Uh Thank you again to all you uh, to all of you who are here today. So, does anybody have any questions for any of our speakers? We have Molly from Gaston County, Michelle and Emily from Iredale, and then Danielle from Partners. About anything we've talked about, does anybody have any comments to make? You can put it in the chat, or I believe you should be able to unmute yourself. If not, to put your hand up. Um, I'll see by getting you unmuted. I'm curious, both from uh, Emily and from Molly, what's your occupancy rate of your shelters? We can, uh, we have eight bedrooms at my sister's house. Um, COVID plays a factor in, in housing, unfortunately. Um, you know, just a few weeks ago, we had a little bit of a scare and we were keeping one person or one family per room. Um, but we we can, we have the availability to double up when we're able to. Um, we just kind of have to look at, look at things. Um, and of course, that also depends on the calls that we have come in that, you know, we don't want to turn an individual away. And we're fortunate to work with surrounding counties to to place individuals if we don't have the availability, but um, those are just factors that play play a role in approving someone here or working with them to to move out of county. I guess a follow on question to that too, uh, to you as well, Molly. So are you, excuse me, are you seeing a growth since COVID in DV? We have, we, I mean, at, in the very beginning of COVID, I think a lot of individuals were afraid to come into a community living. I think just afraid of the unknown. So being somewhere, you know, everything was so shut down. Of course, the shelters weren't, but I think being in a community living 
facility was very scary. So our, our numbers were quite low in the beginning of COVID. And I'll just kind of echo what she said um, as far as capacity. The only thing I will add um, is that with the implementation of the danger assessment for law enforcement, if we if we are we are committed to housing those folks who score at, in the high risk category, and so we have implemented um, kind of a process by which um those individuals and those families would be housed in a shelter in a um, either in the shelter or at a hotel so um if we can find shelter for them in a surrounding county um as long as they're safe there it would be that is an option for us um and then as anecdotally i feel like severity of db has increased and maybe it's just an increase in reporting but um same kind of situation happened in Gaston County where it was the, when COVID first hit. Um, and that's kind of our slow, it was March of, of 2020. And so, and I will say like that early springtime is usually when we get less calls just by nature, just by design. Um, and so during the summer is when it ramps up and our call volume does increase. Um, and it kind of followed suit and people started reaching out for for assistance um but i i don't couldn't give you an exact data point but it to me it seems like the severity of of some of the cases that we are dealing with is um has increased I thank just want to share, um, Shelby had mentioned in the chat, she said, thank you each so much for the work that you do in the community. So I wanted to share that um, just to uh, make sure everyone knew that um, we definitely appreciate the work that you all are doing in your counties and uh, the impact that you're making on our community members. Um, thank you, Imani. Also, Imani has put in the chat contact information for each of our speakers and I think some other documents maybe the speakers have shared. <clears throat> so if you're interested, <clears throat> excuse me, please get a uh, look at those. <clears throat> Anybody, last call. Anybody have any questions, comments, insights for our speakers? If not, thank you, I echo what uh, Amani says. Thank you so much for the work that you do, as well as for your willingness to be here today and to share your story. Uh, um, uh, Molly, could you can you give links to the videos that you did that you did not show? Is that, is that possible? I know it's last <laughs> night asking that. So if you want to see the videos because I I definitely want to watch a couple of them myself. But mm -hmm. thanks to all. And by the way, if any if you know anyone who couldn't be here today to hear this. This, I don't know how long it takes, but this will be posted on our the recording we posted on our website. So you can still access it later. Um, just checking. So make sure there's nothing else in the chat. Thank you so much for being here and hope everyone has a great rest of your week and a great holiday season. Oh, quick announcement. And that is that we will have a speaker uh, next week, our um, next month rather in November, our topic will be about care management. As, and also just talking a little bit about standard plan and, and the Taylor plan as we slowly move towards that uh, that date. Uh, and also the December Community Cafe will be canceled because it is right up on the holiday. And we figure we all have other things that we want to do during that time. So come back in, no, in November for the cafe, but then you can have December to do the things, other things that we do. Thank you very much for being here. I think that brings us to the end.